To continue our discussion of chemical energy and gases, let's talk about section 2 of chapter 7. This section is very math heavy, and we're going to talk about how enthalpy and heat are related, and be able to calculate enthalpy on a molar basis for a reaction. Enthalpy is a quantity that chemists use to discuss the amount of heat changes uh, inside a system. It is analogous to heat. Um, and if we take a look, enthalpy H is equal to the internal energy plus PV, where PV is the work. Now, if we have constant pressure, we only have PV work, then we've seen before that delta E is equal to Q, the heat, at constant pressure, that's what that little P means, minus P delta V, therefore QP is equal to delta E plus P delta V. Now, for enthalpy, if I have a change in enthalpy and I measure the change in enthalpy, that's going to equal the change in the internal energy plus the change in the work. Now, since P is constant, then the delta only applies to the change in volume. Therefore, delta H is equal to delta E plus P delta V. And we've already seen that Q, the lowercase QP, is equal to delta E plus P delta V, which means since they're equal to the same quantity, they must be equal. Delta H is equal to Q at constant pressure. Another way to state delta H would be the enthalpy content of the final portion minus the enthalpy content of the initial is delta H. Or in chemical reactions, the final is our products and the initial is our reactants. So the enthalpy content of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants is the change in enthalpy. The sign of enthalpy is going to be the same as we had for heat. If heat is going into the system from the surroundings, that is an endothermic process, the internal energy increases, the heat is positive, therefore delta H, the change in enthalpy, is positive. If heat is leaving the system to the surroundings, then we have an exothermic process. The internal energy decreases, the sign of Q is negative, as is the sign of delta H. So for endothermic processes, delta H will be positive, and for exothermic processes, delta H will be negative. Let's talk about what this means in terms of reactions. So in our first diagram here, we have what is known as an energy diagram. Uh, and what this does is it shows us graphically where the energy between our reactants and our products lies. So this first one, the reactants are at an energy of 75, and the products are at an energy of 225. So the enthalpy of the products is greater than the enthalpy content of the reactants. That means that delta H, which is products minus reactants, HP minus HR, P is bigger than R, therefore this is going to be a positive sign. Matter of fact, it's a positive 150 using the numbers associated with this graph. Since it is positive, this is an endothermic process. Endothermic process. Additionally, I know it must be energy going into the system because the reactants have less energy than the products. That energy must have come from somewhere. Energy came from the surroundings into the system. Similarly, if we take a look at the second uh, graph here, the reactants, the energy content of the reactants is higher than the products. So HP is less than HR. That means delta H is equal to HP minus HR. This is going to be a negative quantity. In fact, this is a negative 20 according to the numbers we have associated with the graph. Therefore, this must be exothermic. Now, there are a couple other salient points that you need to know about these graphs. Number one, the energy between this hump and where we start in the reactants, this hump is actually called the transition state. The transition state The transition state is 
intermediate between the reactants and the products. It's an unstable um, entity. Um, you can think of this energy here, what is known as the energy of activation, Ea, as being the minimum energy needed to make the reaction go. So the energy of activation. That is the energy between the reactants where you start and the transition state. So you can see for an endothermic reaction, there's a lot of energy that has to go in in order for the reactants to get enough energy to hit the transition state and become products. Now, for the second diagram, this energy of activation is actually quite small. That energy doesn't take much to get an, endothermic, or an exothermic reaction to occur. You can think about something like the burning of methane. It just takes a small spark, a small little tiny bit of energy to get that to combust. And then the reaction proceeds quite smoothly after that. So let's do a problem where we try to figure out what the sign of the enthalpy will be and determine if we have an endothermic or an exothermic process. So A says when solid KBr is dissolved in water, the solution gets colder. Now, a lot of people think that Okay, so it's getting colder, therefore it's losing heat. Well, actually, what you have to remember is that the system here is the KBr, and that the water, or the solution, actually becomes the surroundings. So, if the surroundings are getting colder, then energy must be going into the system. So the KBr must be pulling energy in as it breaks apart in the water. And therefore, the delta H, the sign of delta H, must be positive, and this must be an endothermic reaction. Natural gas, CH4, is burned in a furnace. Well, when you burn something, it gives off heat. Remember, when you feel that heat, you are the surroundings. So the sign of delta H here is going to be negative. This is an exothermic process. When concentrated H2SO4 is added to water, the solution gets very hot. Again, the solution is the surroundings. Therefore, delta H is going to be a negative, and this is an exothermic process. Water is boiled in a tea kettle. Well, if water is being boiled, then you've got to have an energy source, so it must be taking in energy. Therefore, the delta H for this process must be positive, and this must be an endothermic process. Let's do a calculation on enthalpy. So we have the overall reaction in a commercial heat pack can be represented as 4 iron solid plus 3 oxygen gas goes to Fe2O3 solid, with a delta H equaling negative 1,652 kilojoules. And the first part asks us, how much heat is released when 4 moles of iron are reacted with excess oxygen. All right, now, the thing we have to understand is that this delta H value is for the reaction as written, okay? That means when four iron atoms react with three oxygen molecules, you'll get a negative 1,652 um, bits of energy. Um, now, of course, this is in moles, so when 4 moles of iron reacts with 3 moles of oxygen, you get 1,652 kilojoules. So this is really 1,652 kilojoules per mole. But this is for 4 moles of iron. So if 4.00 moles of iron are reacted with excess oxygen, how much energy are we going to get? Well, we can write this as... 4.00 moles of iron times the energy, negative 1,652 kilojoules, but this is per 4 moles of iron, which means that we get negative 1,652 kilojoules of energy. Now, this excess oxygen just means that it's not limiting. So I don't have to worry that this is per 3 oxygen because there's just plenty of oxygen left over. Let's do part B. How much heat is released when 1.00 moles of Fe2O3 is produced? 
So the amount here is negative 1,652 kilojoules, but that's for producing 2 moles of Fe203. So I can write this as 1.00 moles of Fe203 times negative 1,652 kilojoules for every 2 moles of Fe203, and we get negative 826 kilojoules of energy. Let's do part C. What happens if we have 1.00 grams of iron is reacted with excess oxygen? So now, this is 1.00 grams of iron. I need to turn that into moles because this is on a molar basis. Times 1 mole of iron is 55.85 grams of iron times negative 1,652 kilojoules for every 4 moles of iron reacted gives us 7.39 kilojoules of energy. And remember that's a negative because it is an exothermic reaction. Now it asks how much heat is released when 10.0 grams of iron and 2.00 grams of oxygen are reacted. So, this is much like a limiting reactant problem. I have to find out how much energy is produced from the 10 grams of iron and how much energy is produced from the 2 grams of oxygen. So let's start with 10 grams of oxygen of iron, 10.0 grams of iron times 1 mole of iron is 55.85 grams of iron times negative 1,652 kilojoules for every 4 moles of iron reacted. And then we'll do the same thing for oxygen. 2.00 grams of O2 times 1 mole of O2 is 32.00 grams of O2 times negative 1,652 kilojoules, but this time it's for every 3 moles of O2. And we get negative 73.9 kilojoules for the iron and negative 34.4 kilojoules for the oxygen. This is kind of like thinking of uh, enthalpy as being the product, how much heat you produce. Well, you can only produce as much heat as you have reacted. So, my limiting reactant is oxygen, and I can produce negative 34.4 kilojoules of energy.